kind of want to, as we say, stretch your brain a little bit. We just hear the same thing over and over again for all of our Christian lives. We're not going to grow any. All right, good. Here we go. So, uh, looks like Steve Simers is going to pass these out. Who's, who needs one? We've got somebody on the live stream asking if they can get the papers. Yes, I can send you an email of what we're studying. All right, I'll go ahead and put these because... The first part of the outline is everything's on the screen that's on your paper, so we can go ahead and start looking at this. So we're moving from Gnosticism tonight to agnosticism. Tell me what Gnosticism means. Knowledge. And, and really a kind of a special kind of knowledge that only certain people have. And we, we kind of start, uh, finished the class last week on this. Most of the time, this is in regard to the Holy Spirit in the Lord's church today. Holy Spirit revealing things. Um, I've told you guys this many times over the last couple of years. One of the first things I do when I get to the office every morning is I listen to something for myself. I listen to a sermon or a podcast just for myself. I spend all week writing other material for sermons and Bible classes. I need to do my own study for me. So I was listening to a podcast this morning on the Holy Spirit. And uh, because I knew what we were going to be talking about tonight. I went to YouTube and found this and. Uh, the people were talking about, well, how do you know that you're, and I've mentioned this to you before, the, the same idea and other things I've heard. How do you know you're being led by the Holy Spirit? Well, I pray about it. Meditate on it. I ask other people that I think are led by the Holy Spirit if I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that I heard today was, I feel I'm being led by the Holy Spirit when other people start to question what I do. I don't know what that means. And he didn't really expound on that. I feel like I'm being led to, by the Holy Spirit when other people start to question where I'm going. His phrase was, where I'm at. He ended his sentence in a preposition, and you're not supposed to do that. Well, how do you know? If other people are questioning you about what you're saying and what you're trying to do, how do you know it's the Holy Spirit? And why would you say, I feel like? I mean, that's wholly subjective. When you look at the function of the Holy Spirit, in the, particularly in the book of Acts, some people, so you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What are those four books called together? The Gospels. The book of Acts has been, has been called by some people, and I think to an extent rightly so, the gospel of the Holy Spirit. Because it starts out in chapter 1. Jesus makes that promise to the apostles of, I'm leaving, but you're going to be endued with power from the Holy Spirit beginning in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1, basically verses 5 through 8. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit's poured out. And throughout the book, you see the Holy Spirit communicating directly with words. Every time the Holy Spirit communicated with someone, as we have recorded in Scripture, it's through words. It's not through a feeling. It's not through a nudge, an idea. It's he speaks to them directly. So this idea that is floating out there today and these two men that we're talking this morning are both preachers in churches of Christ. And they're talking about being led by the Holy Spirit and what it essentially what it feels like and how they think that might be happening is anti-biblical it's anti-biblical is what it is but that's a form of gnosticism because gnosticism is what special knowledge hidden knowledge that nobody else has that's why we looked at the book of colossians part of the colossian heresy was these false teachers were coming into the church and saying you guys don't have all you need and so paul warns them against vain philosophy colossians chapter 2 and verse 8 if you, have it, if you have Christ, if you have the gospel, you have all the riches of Christ. Colossians chapter 2, I think that's verse 3. Colossians 2, 3. So, you, Gnosticism is thousands of years old, but it still exists, and it exists even in the Lord's church today. That's why it's important to study this. Uh, but most of the time, the way I see it manifested is in regard to the 
work of the Holy Spirit today. And some people, actually I had a request to do some sermons on the work of the Holy Spirit today. So we'll be dealing with that on Sundays here before too awful long. Any questions or comments on anything I just said? That's a great question. Tammy asks, okay, if these guys are claiming to be led by the Holy Spirit, basically, what knowledge do they have that's not a part of the New Testament, let's say? None. So what does that tell you? If the the part of the work of the Holy Spirit was to reveal the word to the prophets and apostles and people like this, and to guide them as they were, I would say, both speaking and writing. So they're making a claim that, well, I feel this, but they're not teaching anything new apart from, I feel this. That's new. You know, that's not biblical at all. Yeah. Well, it makes their knowledge, they're a level above us. They're a little more spiritual than we are. But they have, the thing is, they have to consult among themselves to make sure that's really what it is in the first place. Do you, so think about, think in your mind of Scripture. How many times have you read through the Bible in your life and you think about all the passages you've read? Does the Holy Spirit ever give anybody a feeling in Scripture? He's always speaking to people. Directly. And not just directly, but... Okay, so an example I think of is Acts chapter 8 with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Go join yourself to that chariot. Why didn't the Holy Spirit just go directly to the chariot and do it for him? Instead of having Philip take his time to go out and do this, the Spirit could have gone to the eunuch, but God has always used men to communicate the gospel to other men. So this claim that there is this uh, special guidance from the Holy Spirit, do this real quick. Turn over to John chapter 14, please. This claim that there's some special guidance from the Holy Spirit today, apart from the revealed will of God, is Gnostic. John 14, and I want somebody to read verse 26. I was listening to a lecture, and this has been several weeks ago, but the lecture was on the work of the Holy Spirit in the church today, and this verse was cited. John 14, 26, somebody. Okay, he will teach you what? All things, okay? So I was watching this lecture, and just to let you know where it was from, it was from Pepperdine University, which is about as far left as you can get in terms of Christendom. But the the lecture referenced John 14, trying to talk about us today, and he said, and this is how he read it, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you things. That's quite a bit different than he will teach you all things, isn't it? But that's a claim. That's a Gnostic claim. I have special knowledge from the Holy Spirit because he's teaching me things. John 14 is Jesus talking to his disciples about him leaving earth and him sending the Holy Spirit to them to teach them all things. And it's not just that, and to bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. How much has Jesus said to you lately? Audibly. Zero. Not a thing. So, how could that verse apply to you then? If, he's, if the Holy Spirit's going to bring to your remembrance everything that He said to you, and He's not said anything to you, guess what the Holy Spirit's going to bring to your remembrance? Nothing. All right, any questions on all of that? No, there are not versions that leave out all. And he was reading it, but that's how he read it. But you would have to hear the rest of his lecture because it was pretty uh, obvious what he believes. Yeah. 
No. I, I don't. They knew, yeah. Okay, somebody turn over to read 1 Corinthians 14, and I believe it's verse 37. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. things I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. In that same chapter, Paul says, I have the Spirit of God. The inspired authors, the inspired speakers knew that they were being guided by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't a feeling, and they didn't have to go talk to anybody about it. They didn't have to consult. It was, new, it, it, it was known. All right? Right, part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, yes. That's a good question. What was the Holy Spirit doing while Jesus was here? Yeah. Right. Here's a good way to picture this, and, and Scripture kind of lays this out. You see the Holy Spirit throughout, from, I mean, from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation 22. But who is, so in terms of the Godhead, who is the primary actor in the Old Testament? Jehovah, the Father, okay? You get to the Gospels, it's Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit's working throughout that whole time. But even the Gospels, if you're making notes, write down John 7, verses 38 and 39. <clears throat> John 7, 38 and 39. He's working throughout all of that time. But in John 7, 38 and 39, Jesus, well, John, by writing, tells us that the Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And that's a, resurrect, that, that's a reference to his resurrection and ascension. It was after that, because that's what Jesus says here in John 14, 15, and 16. When I leave, and, and all three members are mentioned here, I'm going to leave, and the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit to you. That's, that's yes, for comfort, for guidance. Um, and a lot of your Old Testament prophets talk about this. The, the manifestation of power, like Joel chapter 2, God would pour forth from His Spirit, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, so even the Old Testament indicated that there was a, a time coming in the future where the Holy Spirit would be, where His um, work would be predominant. And that was after the resurrection and ascension of Christ. Yeah. What were you going to say? That's, that's a good question. Because no. Has anybody ever described the feeling? That's... I would like to know, what does it feel like? Because you, if you don't mean it feels like something, then what do you mean by saying, it fe I feel like it? it? It doesn't make, it's kind of nonsensical to me. Because again, well, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. He spoke. It was not a feeling. They felt goosebumps. Sure. Okay. Well, and here's the hard thing about claims like goosebumps and feelings. You can't argue with them. What are you going to do? Stand there and say, no, you didn't. And I've had that same experience, if you want to use that word. Certain songs, man, they just, they hit you, don't they? But that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's giving you a feeling. Yes. Yes. 
But doesn't, doesn't the Bible already tell us that God is good and God loves everyone? There's no new revelation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, and I've said this before, and then let's get to our slides here. There is a lot of, I would call it superstition, in regard to the Holy Spirit, in regard to being led by you know things laid on your heart and such. There's a lot of superstition, and it is typically very vague, like you're saying. Yeah, the Bible already says that stuff. So why would God come and repeat it to you and just to you? Yeah. Well, I've been told that. I, I was told one time by a, by a charismatic preacher that... I had a form of godliness, but I denied its power because I questioned him about the Holy Spirit. And I view them as like they can't trust faith and believe what the word says, so they're praying for something more yeah. than their emotions have control. Yeah. Well, the Bible's such an old book. Surely there's something different out there now. Yeah. All right. Somebody says, uh, we are moved by our own emotions. I think this is what Brooke was talking about. We can be moved by our emotions and not by something the Spirit does to or for us. That's true. All right, so let's move from this special knowledge to agnosticism. And I told Keith Rose this has nothing to do with agriculture, so just keep that in mind. At its core, agnosticism is the belief that the existence of a higher power or deity is unknown or unknowable. It's not a rejection of the idea of God. And this person writing was an agnostic. They're explaining, so you'll see this lowercase g but rather an acknowledgement that there is no way to definitively prove or disprove the existence of a higher power. So let's think just quickly. Um, is there anything in Scripture that talks to us about ways we can know that there is, let's use their language, a higher power? Does the Bible tell us any way that we can know that a higher power exists? The heavens, what do they do? They declare the glory of God, and the firmament, the expanse, shows His handiwork. Re uh, Romans chapter 1 talks about the creation. It says that you have the creation, you can see it, and essentially those who deny the existence of God are without excuse, because His power can be seen in the things that are made. So, but, but agnosticism says it's either unknown or you can't come to know it. It's not possible to know. Some agnostics may believe that it is possible for a higher power to exist, but that there's no evidence to prove or disprove its existence. Others may hold that the concept of a higher power is meaningless and therefore cannot be discussed or debated. That last sentence there, cannot be discussed or debated. There are Christians who actually feel that way, that you shouldn't discuss religion with other religious people. Just leave people alone. Have you ever read Acts? Those of you on Sunday mornings? What, go what goes on from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 28 other than that? One of the most common misconceptions about agnosticism is that it is a position of uncertainty or indecision. Now again, this was an agnostic writing this. That's exactly what it is. It is exactly a position of uncertainty or indecision. Making an assertion that it's not is self-contradictory. However, this is not the case. Agnostics have a strong conviction that the existence of a higher power cannot be proven or disproven with certainty. This conviction is rooted in the recognition of the limitations of human knowledge and the complexity of the universe. Do you see a problem with that last sentence? Limitations of human knowledge and what? The complexity of the universe? That's exactly what points to a higher power. That's exactly what points to a, a more intelligent and intentional being than us. Because what, so if, kind of lurching towards atheism here, but what's the other option if there is no creator and intelligent designer? It's either eternal or it created itself. 
There is no third option there. Everything is here forever. It all created itself or something outside of it created it. There's no third op There's no fourth option there. All right, so here we go. There are two groups of agnostics. So here's where we start filling in some blanks on your sheet. Those who say, I do not know, and I'm emphasizing certain words here. I don't know. And I would consider that type of an agnostic a little more, I don't know if honest is the right word, but, and I'll show you why I say that's a little more honest. I do not know. The second group of agnostics say it cannot be known. That's a little more, I think a good word might be belligerent, <laughs> stubborn. If you say, I don't know, that's one thing. If you say, nobody can know it, well, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother ball ballgame. Uh, be turning over to 1 Timothy chapter 1, please. 1 Timothy chapter 1. So here's the question. If there's a person who says, I don't know if there is a higher power. I don't know if there is a creator or a designer. Here's the question. What kind of evidence would be sufficient for you to get off the fence? To, let's say, push you in one direction or the other to say, okay, now I know that there is, or now I know that there isn't. And a lot of times the answer is, well, there isn't. there's just no evidence because it can't be known. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, somebody read 3 through 7 for us, please. Okay, stop right there for a second. Listen to this wording here. Fables. The Greek word is muthos. Mythology is the word. It's where we get our English word myth from. Okay, endless genealogies. Who in the Bible, what group of people in the Bible might genealogies mean something to? The Jewish people. You don't need to worry about all that stuff. And the reason you don't need to worry about all that stuff is because, well, they just bring up more questions. There's no... There's no solidity provided by just con constantly raising questions. All right, keep going there. Okay, verse six there, vain jangling. The, King James, the New King James says idle talk. All right, worthless words, you're just going on about nothing. Now listen to verse 7 here. Understanding neither what they say, okay, the word, that these guys desire to be teachers of the law, verse, what was that? Back up earlier, uh, in that verse. They don't understand what they say, first of all. But they don't understand what they affirm, and that word affirm in the Greek means it's a confident assurance. They're so confident about things they don't know. Well, that's his point. If they don't know, they shouldn't be teaching it. Because as you keep reading here, well, he's already talked about, um, don't pay attention to fables and genealogies, but you need to be teaching doctrine. Then you get down to verse 10. There are things that are contrary to sound doctrine. If you're just going on about things you don't know about, maybe you need to sit down and keep your mouth shut. But essentially, that's what agnosticism is. is and again, the, I would say the first option, I don't know, is more honest than it cannot be known. Scripture presents evidence. Okay, Christianity, faith is not just blindly accepting, well, it shouldn't be. It's not just blindly accepting what you've always heard without any questions, what your parents taught you, what your grandparents taught you. And that's not to... Not denigrating your parents or your great your, or your grandparents. It's you need your own faith, and uh, you need to be willing to ask questions and and have some pushback on your questions and things like this. Yeah. Well, I suppose if it's a 
If it's a true agnostic, maybe Jesus is a myth. Maybe the gospel, here's one, the gospels aren't really reliable. They've been corrupted so much. There are, there are outs from John 8, 32, let's say. I don't, trust the, I don't trust the documents of the New Testament. Things like that, you know. Um, all right, well, let's look at, let's look at, okay. So, and maybe, Jeff, this is maybe kind of in line with what you're talking about. So, in talking about Gnosticism, I gave you some examples, and specifically with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you three examples that I personally have had over the years, and on more than one occasion, of agnosticism in the church. That things that you cannot know. So here we go. Number one, I don't know what the Holy Spirit does, but He must do something. I mean, after all, Acts 2.38 says you believe and are baptized, or you repent and are baptized, and you get the Holy Spirit. Is that what Acts 2.38 says? You are baptized and get the Holy Spirit? I don't think so. Yeah, God, God is able to communicate clearly. But this is a view that people have. I don't know everything he does. I don't know everything he does either. Are you willing to sit there and tell me you know everything that the Holy Spirit's doing? He's not. Um, well, I don't want to go in that way right now, but but he must do something. And so I have a feeling I got goosebumps whatever the manifestation of those feelings are. Have you ever had an inner dialogue? You ever talked with yourself without ever opening your mouth? If you don't, you might ought to start doing that. Uh, it's not a bad thing to do. Don't answer your own questions. <laughs> what did you say? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's only bad if you lose the argument. Some people feel that when you do that kind of thing, that that's the Holy Spirit communicating with you. Well, again, that's a, that would be a special, that would be, what would that be other than miraculous? If he's talking to you, he's verbalizing himself to you. That's nothing more, that's nothing less than a miracle. But that's one, one expression of, I don't know, of agnosticism that I've heard within Christians. Well, I don't know what he does, but he must be doing something. Okay. Here's one. I don't know how to worship because the Bible doesn't speak of a worship service. Have you guys, have any of you ever talked to anybody who said that? The Bible doesn't say anything about a worship service. I've had that, I've actually had that conversation with people. And that is a, technically, that's a true statement. The Bible doesn't technically use the phrase worship service. But if you have a group of believers who come together on the first day of the week to serve God in worship, what else are you going to call it? You, do you have a better name for it? But there are people who, there, and I was, I actually back several years ago was emailing back and forth with a guy uh, who was struggling with this, and um, he, he, was a, he was like, there is no way to know what should be involved in our worship service today. The one exception to that would be the Lord's Supper. But apart from that, you just, we just don't know. Because there's not one, and, and part of his argument was, there's not one verse that says what we should do in the worship service. Well, there's not one verse that says what you should do in your Christian life in general, as far as I know, that tells you everything. God doesn't have to lay everything out for you in bullet point fashion. Imagine how long Scripture would be if everything you were supposed to do and everything you were not supposed to do was in this book. So, that's a form of Gnosticism. I don't know how to worship because the Bible doesn't tell me exactly how to do it. Well, it does. Here's a third one. I don't know if it's a sin to drink because the Bible doesn't say, Thou shalt not drink. Well, you know what else the Bible doesn't say? Thou shalt not use meth, and thou shalt not use cocaine, and etc., etc. It's it's like people sometimes Christians can be maybe you've heard it said before so open-minded that their brain falls out. 
They're looking for something, but they don't find exactly what they want, so they don't know anything. I just don't know. That's agnosticism. <laughs> yeah. Along with free will, he gave us common sense, yeah. 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 Any questions or comments on anything we've said so far? Sure. But the argument is, drunk, being drunk is a sin, drinking is not. Here's my question. My, well, here's my question. How do you know when you're drunk? When does being drunk start? Yeah, other people know. Yeah, that's, well, is that true? Other people know. <laughs> you, you may not, but other people can see it. That's pretty close, yeah. Well, that, so these are just examples, personal conversations that I've had over the years that display agnosticism. I just don't know. And so, therefore, since I don't know, you can't tell me that the Holy Spirit didn't move me. Or you can't tell me that, that I can't drink. Listen, I can't tell you anything in that sense. I can't make you do anything or make you not do anything. But yeah. Yeah, our body's the temple. This is a choice. I think agnosticism is a choice. Um, I think there's something to that, yeah. And it, a bit of arrogance, ar arrogance, I think absolutely can be. I do think there are some sincere folks who just, maybe they don't know enough, and that's, that's, their, that's just where they are. I just don't know. Well, that's why we're told to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, and that's kind of another thing in terms of Gnosticism, this special knowledge that comes from the Holy Spirit, that's claimed comes from the Holy Spirit. Somebody turn over to 2 Timothy 2 and read verse 15. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Somebody, somebody makes a good comment here. The Bible tells us there is a God and the Bible is true. Uh, it can be proven by historical events and documents. It lines up with so many facts that can. Uh, biblical archaeology has done wonders to fortify people's faith. Things like apologetics press. It, there's, well, there's a phrase that I've come to like. This guy's talking about the, the existence of so many um, manuscripts all the way back to the late first century of the New Testament and the Old Testament. He says, we have an embarrassment of riches. There is so much evidence, it's embarrassing not to believe. And that's true. All right, 2 Timothy 2.15. If it is the case that the Christian is going to be led directly by the Holy Spirit into knowledge, why do we have to study? Why do I have to spend hours a week putting together sermon and Bible class material? Why not just wait for the Holy Spirit to nudge me and to give it to me? Okay, well, all right. If you don't study, you don't know. Think about this. So, <clears throat> Brother Moser used to do this. He taught, the, we had a course at Memphis, a whole quarter on the, the Holy Spirit and Scripture. And his challenge was in the beginning of that class, I want you to close your Bible Forget everything you ever knew about the Bible. Everything. And tell me what you know about the Holy Spirit. What could you tell me about the Holy Spirit if you had never cracked open a Bible? You couldn't tell me anything about anything. You would, you'd be like the Ephesians there in Acts 19. We don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. So... That tells me something about how he has functioned in history and how he lead, has led people. So it's always been through words. It's not through feelings. Is that, is that everything? Well, yeah. Yeah. 
That's probably there in First uh, Timothy chapter one. Oh yeah, First Corinthians fourteen, verse thirty, verse thirty-eight. Yeah, let him acknowledge the things I write are the commandments of the Lord. If you're going to be ignorant, yeah, so be it. That's a hard statement, isn't it? If they're going to be ignorant, they're going to be ignorant. It's kind of like have you think about the times Jesus said, um, "He who has ears to hear, let him hear." Same thing. If you're not willing to listen, I can't help you. <clears throat> yeah. It, it, so yeah, so saying it cannot be known, the Bible tells us, again, kind of put Scripture aside for a minute and think about that quote about agnosticism, the, the limitations of human knowledge and the complexity of the universe. You look at the order, the structure, the, the functionality, not just the appearance of it, but how everything functions in the universe. You're going to tell me that you don't know or that you can't know that there was an intelligent designer that causes your body to function just the right way in just the right times to keep you alive for 70 to 80 years. Just happened. No. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. These people have this special knowledge. I don't have it. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. One end feeds the other. Good observation. I didn't know that. I was agnostic about that. <clears throat> 